Sultan! Sultan! Someone was calling for him. It shook him from his reverie. There was a report for him. News from Malta. He had outlived them all. That Spanish prince Charles and his brother Ferdinand, Francis, King of France, all the Hungarian princes who had come and gone, but they had all been replaced by younger men, and here he remained, feeling very, very old. Philip, the Spanish prince that succeeded Charles, had used the wealth he had garnered from that far-off new world to rebuild a navy, and had declared himself the eternal enemy of all but the Catholic faith. For years his ships had harried Ottoman fleets, and contested their mastery of the Mediterranean. While his successes were limited, they emboldened other enemies of the port. And one old foe had grown too bold, the Knights of Malta. They had used their island in the center of the sea to serve as a safe harbor for Christian fleets looking to disrupt trade from North Africa. He closed his eyes. All of his old decisions seemed to haunt him, even those he'd thought were the best. When he had once so proudly cast the Knights Hospitaller out of their sanctuary on Rhodes, he had in his magnanimity let them live in peace and establish themselves on another island further from his shores, Malta. These were the same Knights he had defeated so long ago, back when all was glory and everything seemed possible. He smiled for a moment, remembering that mighty campaign. But now he was old and tired, and none of his friends were by his side. Instead of going himself, he had sent subordinates to deal with a threat. He sent 30,000 men and 200 ships to crush the Christian fastness in his sea. The knights had recalled all of their members from abroad, but still, his forces outnumbered them three to one. But this wasn't the disunified Europe that he had faced in his youth. While there were still great rifts in Christendom, his messengers had told him that a league had come together to reinforce the Knights of Malta. His ships were swift, and at first took Europe by surprise, but not the Maltese Knights. Though they hadn't expected him so early, they knew he would come. They had strengthened their mighty redoubts, shored up their walls, and stocked their larders. And when his men landed, the men of Malta all hid behind their walls. The land itself was his. Only the three great fortresses of St. Elmo, St. Angelo, and St. Michael defied him. But his command was split. His commander-in-chief was a man of 70, with less experience in military matters than matters political. The rest of his command were hardened veterans of the sea, privateers and admirals. There was constant conflict in command. As soon as the first contingent of his forces arrived at Malta, his commander-in-chief immediately had them disembark and begin sieging the small fort of St. Elmo. For three weeks, they bombarded the fortress. The small garrison, some 400 strong, died to a man. But their valiant stand cost the Turks three weeks, and in the indignities that God now seemed to rain upon him, his best commander was killed in the useless siege by a fragment of loose stone. Meanwhile, reinforcements from Lombardy had made their way to the more formidable forts on the island. Filled with rage, his commander-in-chief had the corpses of those who had died defending St. Elmo nailed to boards and thrown under ramparts of the enemy fortresses, so they might see what became of those who resisted him. But the Grand Master of the Hospitallers ordered those Turks that had been thus far captured in the fighting executed, and their heads shot from cannons into the Ottoman camp. The fighting grew grim and ugly. The Ottoman plan seemed to devolve down into an all-out assault, but in the blistering heat of mid-July, the men simply could not take the high walls of the Knights of Malta. By September, a large Christian fleet sailed for Malta, with supplies and a massive force to bolster the defense of the remaining strongholds. The Ottoman admirals were torn. They knew that if this fleet landed, the invasion was over. Victory would be impossible. They'd be left only with retreat. But what would happen if they fought this fleet and lost? There would be no retreat. There would not even be supplies. The entire invasion force would be lost. Timidity won the day. And so, with staggering casualties and nothing to show for it, the once invincible force of the Empire had had to withdraw. The note fell from his hand. He knew what this would mean, how the world would see it. The power and prestige, the empire that was a glory to all the world, these things would no longer be. His empire, which even the mightiest monarchs of Europe feared, would no longer be seen as some supernatural force, some all-powerful actor on the world stage, but simply as another nation. And here he was, forced to make the decision he knew he would have to make, the decision which had conjured in his mind thoughts of that old Roman emperor, a gamble. Does he accept this new and humble place for his empire, acting with the prudence that reason might perhaps dictate? Or does he embrace destiny as the master of the lands of Caesar and Alexander, and show the world his might by doing the one thing he had never been able to do? He knew what that old Roman would do, and he knew what it had cost his empire. But he could not help but make the same choice. In the end, they were very much alike.
He would march on Vienna one last time. He would at last capture that capital of the Habsburgs and show the Christian world that rather than finally repelling the Ottoman Empire from Europe, they had merely parried one inconsequential thrust. That the Ottoman juggernaut could not be stopped from rolling across all the lands of the world. He marshaled his forces and, for the first time in ten years, planned to lead them himself. On the 1st of May, 1566, with the finest display the world had ever seen, his army departed the capital. It was good to be out of the city, away from the tombs and the memories, away from the politics. He only wished that he could ride, like in the olden days. He was too frail, too worn by the years, and too riddled with aches and pains to ride. Even in his carriage, every bump seared his gout-ridden joints. But still, he would not have them slow the army for him. Again, rain and bad weather plagued them. It reminded him of earlier times. How many times had nature herself opposed him? Should he have taken it as a sign? As he crossed into Transylvania, the prince he had helped install there scattered jewels about his throne in reverence. This was what it meant to be sultan. And yet the rain, always the rain. His army marched on. The rain fell. The ground swallowed cannon. Rivers carried away oxen whole. And yet they made it to Seged, the first town they were to besiege. For a moment, he felt young again. He mounted a horse and ordered the cannonade. But then the weakness came back. He started to sweat. He asked a nearby aide to help him back to his tent. Time passed. He didn't know how much time. He just heard the ceaseless beating of the rain. He would fade in and out of awareness. Sometimes he would wake and there would be faces bending over him. Sometimes he would be alone, except for his guards. The rain beat down. It was after sunset. The light in the tent was dim, and Ibrahim sat in a chair next to him. He put a hand on his shoulder. Ibrahim smiled at him. I know you're frightened, but there was never anything we couldn't accomplish together. He felt an ache in his chest. He had something he had to tell Ibrahim, something to apologize for, but he couldn't quite remember. He hoped they'd go hawking tomorrow, if only it didn't rain. His eyes opened. Everything was a sort of haze, everything except the handsome face of Mustafa. He was glad to see him. The boy was hard to get along with sometimes, but he was a fine man and he would make a great sultan, perhaps even a better one than he had. He was proud to have such a son. He wanted to give the boy his sword. Where'd he put it? No, no, that, that wasn't it. Something else. Something he wanted to say to him. Ah, he hoped he'd be kind to his brothers. He drifted off again to the sound of rain on the pavilion. He woke and it was dark. Roxelana was sitting at the foot of his bed. She was like she was in his youth. He tried to reach for her, and she put a finger to her lips. Rest now, you're almost done. No one can fault you for things you've done for love. His eyes closed. Rain and time. He vaguely wondered what happened to the fortress outside. Then he closed his eyes.